Welcome to the Mid-Career Comeback, Finding Clarity and Opportunity When Adversity Strikes. My name is Gloria Ko, and I serve as Senior Director for Alumni Career Engagement at UCLA Alumni Affairs. We're excited to have you here for this workshop with career coach and Bruin, Jim Yorks. Today's program will help you understand your psychological buttons that are being pushed during times of uncertainty and give you simple tools for responding to vocational crisis. I wanted to take the opportunity to thank our Alumni Association sustaining donors. It's with your help that we are able to strengthen the Bruin community with career programs like this. I am excited to introduce Jim Yorks, class of 1994. Jim is an executive and career coach and licensed clinical social worker who specializes in helping intelligent, inquisitive professionals navigate vocational change. Jim received his bachelor's degree in sociology from UCLA Jim is part of our Career Coaches Network, so if you're interested in connecting with him, you can find more information on our website. Now, I'll turn it over to Jim. Hi, everybody. Uh, I can't see anybody, so uh, I can't say it's nice to see you here, but I'm glad that everyone is on the call with us, and I'm really touched, actually, at times like this when I see the you know participant count approaching 200. Um, you know, it's such a difficult time for everyone as evidenced by this kind of participation. You know, the description that I wrote for this course wasn't sunshine and butterflies. You know, this course or this webinar is meant to appeal to people that are having a difficult time of things right now. Uh, you know, on a scale of one to 10, maybe between three and 10. And so there's a lot of people out there experiencing that difficulty uh, now. And so I find it touching that everyone sort of comes together at times like this. And I hope you can take some solace in that yourself, you know, at a time during COVID when we're all so isolated and separated from each other that, you know, you're not in it alone in your career concerns. So um, just wanted to point that out and just thank you all for showing up uh, because I really enjoy uh, speaking here at UCLA. So with that, why don't I share my screen? And we'll get started. Here we are, mid-career comeback, finding clarity and opportunity when adversity strikes. So who is this for? If you've faced layoff or business closure uh, this year because of COVID or your job or industry has been disrupted or you're feeling stuck or stagnant and you've just sort of ground to a halt in your career and you're looking to get things moving and you know onward and upward in your career or you faced any other past, current, or future disruption, which might include approaching retirement and wondering what you're going to do at that uh, next sort of mile marker. So I'm not here to give what you might think of as a typical career coach presentation about you know, the latest in resume design or how to ace an Amazon interview or how to connect with the hiring manager on LinkedIn or to get a promotion or things like this. If you're obsessing about anything like that, then I wanna give you official UCLA sanctioned permission to give yourself a break just for the next hour from worrying about those details, okay? Because what I'd like to submit for your consideration this evening is that those details are just a tiny minuscule part of what really matters as you formulate your next move in your career. It may well be that it's your relationship to your work that's what's holding you back from the vocational life of your dreams that you're looking for. And if you get that right, then you'll never have to sweat the details ever again. So our premise tonight is that, yeah, everything's up in the air. Maybe it would have been anyway. Maybe you were approaching retirement. Maybe you were uh, approaching a, a place of stagnation and wanting to move forward in your career anyway. But now, given what's transpired over the past year, uh, everything feels even more unstable and up in the air. What we want to do is take advantage of the opportunity that's presented itself to us at this time and allow the details to sort them out, sort themselves out in a way that suits you best, your best you best. And if possible, 
just enjoy this phase of your life too, okay? So just quickly who I am, I'm an executive and career coach, a psychotherapist, mindfulness meditation teacher, and hypnotherapist. And what I do in all of those is try to apply the science of well-being, whether that be in psychology, neurobiology, social psychology, or other life and social sciences, and blend them together for peak performance and satisfaction at the same time. You can't really have one without the other, in my view. Everything's up in the air. So I submit for your consideration that we actually have an opportunity here to take advantage of, and that it is, in fact, possible to enjoy this disruption. So here I am. And as Gloria mentioned, I am a Bruin. I a uh, very proud Bruin. I have to be honest, I went to grad school at a different school across town. But um, what you see here is pretty much how I looked when I went to class every day. So I, I was uh, not the most popular kid in school, but uh, I stayed true to, to uh, UCLA. So I want to kick this off with addressing some well-intentioned myths. Now, most myths in the realm of the career world or the personal development world are well-intentioned, and they're also oversimplified uh, versions of a very complex uh, human psychology, and they end up doing us harm. And so the first one I want to address, I'm going to address two, and this first one we're going right toward the, the most sacred cow of, of the working world, which is work-life balance. Okay. Now, do I think this is a myth because we should all work ourselves to death? No, not at all, quite to the contrary. I think everyone can agree that life is about you know, more than work and that's what this concept is trying to impart. So the, the problem is that the languaging of the concept is wrong and how we language things matters because how we language things affects the way we think about them. And the way we think about them is what creates our beliefs around the topic. And then from there, that's how we act and that affects our well-being. So when we use this term, work-life balance, what we're saying for one thing is that work and life are two separate things. When we know from the research quite clearly that vocational activity is crucial to human well-being. So from a basic needs standpoint, um, you know, we suffer terribly psychologically when we're idle and also physically, by the way, we have higher rates of heart attack and earlier mortality when we're idle. And from a psychological human well-being standpoint, we suffer when we don't have some sort of meaning or purpose of some kind in at least some of our vocational activity. Okay. Now, so we, you know, so work is part of a well-lived life. And but when we split our life into these two then really we're splitting ourselves into two because we are sort of forced to view ourselves then as a worker sometimes and a liver, you know, the rest of the time. But we know that it's when we're one single entity, whole and integrated, that we're at our happiest and most effective in life and in work. So just think of the last time that you were in a flow state, you know, you were engaged in some activity where time and space dropped away and you were one with the activity, right? If you've experienced that, you know how great that is. And actually, the more of those flow experiences you can piece together, the happier you'll, you'll be. So the last thing that we need is to be split along these lines of work and life, okay? And then finally, you can just do some basic math here. I mean, you start out with 168 hours a week at your disposal. If you deduct sleep, work, and grocery shopping and all the humdrum details of life that feel like chores too, best case scenario, 
you're left with 40 or 50 hours a week of your precious life. Are you willing to just have that be the time that you live? And that's just best case scenario, by the way. So, you know, most professionals uh, have practically zero uh, time outside of work and all those chores and sleep. So, and not to mention the time that we do have is mostly crammed into the weekend. Okay, so intrinsic motivators, they are intangible, they're subjective. So you can feel whether you have one and only you can feel it. Okay. Others might be able to guess whether you feel this thing or not, but only you know for sure. And they're also limitless, okay? There's no end to them because they're conceptual. They're not objective mile markers, they're concepts. So if you have an objective goal, like maybe to have a million dollars in your checking account, let's say, and you get it, then you say, okay, well now what? Or if you get the promotion this time, you know, that they passed you over for last time, and you say, okay, now I got it, now what? Well, an intrinsic motivator doesn't have a now what? Okay. If you're motivated by compassion, justice, animal welfare, okay, any other concept, it's an orientation for you and not a quantity. Okay. This is an important distinction. So really this picture that I gave you of human well-being, this two-dimensional sort of beach ball really is only part of the story because the real picture of human well-being actually looks like this. It's three-dimensional. It looks more like a bucket than a ball, okay? So in each of those domains, yeah, you have some uh, basic needs that need to be met up here, you know, like, um, um, you know, like for work, like I said, you need to be busy doing something, be productive in some way instead of being idle. But there's a lot of different ways that you can be busy and not be idle, right? So we're looking for the ways that are intrinsically gratifying for you. And for each of us, those intrinsic motivators show up in a pattern that's unique to you. It's as unique as your fingerprint. And so it's important that you figure out what yours are. So and when we start to gratify ourselves in those ways, then we start to fill up this bucket. So some examples, let's say this person has an intrinsic motivator of craftsmanship. And so they work on their craft and they have this intrinsic gratification that no one else can really, you know, experience or feel or even tell, but the person who's doing it can, and that's all that really matters. Maybe socially, respect, connection. Around the back there, maybe uh, some mindfulness in the work that they do. So maybe this person is a, you know, a woodworker, say, in a, in a wood shop or something. Um, it's often hard for people to gratify themselves in the physical domain through their work, but a lot of people like who work outside or who have active types of careers are able to do that too. Okay. But hopefully you can see where I'm going here. The way that you can gratify yourself as a whole person, even though work takes up more than its fair share of your time and energy is because through your work, it's possible to gratify yourselves in more than just the vocational domain. That's what I'm getting at here. And so your work is a big part of filling up all of your buckets, okay? So hopefully that was clear. I'm, again, I'm sorry for all these tech glitches, but hopefully that point uh, comes home to you. So the other myth is this one, this concept of resilience that I swear it's everywhere. You know, I see it in, there's books about it. It's on morning shows, TED Talks. Actually, the, the last uh, in-person event that I attended before COVID was an event for therapists. And they were going around the room and they asked everyone to uh, describe what it is that they help their clients to achieve. And I swear, like I was counting, 75% of them mentioned resilience somewhere in their answer. Okay, so this messaging is everywhere. And, you know, what's, what's the problem with that? You know, is it because I think that being strong and able to withstand difficulty is a bad thing? No, it's because 
back in 2009, scientists realized that resilience and growth are inversely related to each other. Okay, so what that means is that left to run its natural course, your natural strategy of coping when adversity strikes is likely to give you one or the other of those things and not both. Okay, the more that you have of one, the less you're gonna have of the other, okay? And so you might be thinking, well, why is that the case? And how can all these therapists be wrong? It's not that they're wrong. It's that they're, I think, misinformed and they've fallen prey to another one of these, you know, well-intentioned myths, okay? Let's look at what the definition of resilience is. It's to maintain or quickly regain the level of functioning you had before the event. Okay, so I've highlighted some words in that definition. Maybe you already can see why it might be problematic. Okay, so let's take a look at this line here. Let's say that this line represents your vocational life throughout, throughout your whole life. Okay, so maybe, okay, pointer, maybe here you had a good time at your first job and then somewhere along the line, you went to college, graduated, but your, you know, the company went out of business. You rebounded and years later, you became a senior manager somewhere and you were kind of firing at all cylinders. You were on top of the world. Some years later, COVID strikes and here we are, okay? So let's say that we go to that, that point. Here we are. Well, if we're to regain the level of functioning we previously had, then what we're talking about is that point. Okay. Now notice from, from here where we are in this COVID location, say, you might have some sense that there's better days ahead. Now you, you probably can't see all of this, but if you're maybe a natural optimist, you might think, well, there's, you know, brighter days ahead, right? You can't see this future. Okay. From where you are. But Nevertheless, you adopt this strategy of resilience. I'm gonna be a resilient person and regain my, the level of functioning I had before COVID. And there goes the peak that you had in your distant future, gone before you could even see it. Okay, because now you've limited yourself to this, this peak. So now let's say, you know, we rebound from COVID, something else happens 10 years from now, it takes you down a little bit more. Well, now you actually maybe do have a sense that there's you know a, a higher high ahead of you, but as a resilient person, okay, you're not going to see it, right? You're trying to regain the level of functioning you previously had, and so you can see that over time, what adopting resilience as a strategy is doing to you is it's averaging you down in your functioning, in your achievement, in your performance, in your well-being to a flatter and flatter line. Now, if you really go whole hog on resilience and you also want to um, avoid you know, dropping in the first place, right? Then you're also going to bring the bottom up so that you don't fall as far next time. And so now you're operating within a very narrow band of existence. And before you know it, your lifeline looks something like that. And you kind of end up running out the clock. And unfortunately, I see this often. And it's really a shame because that's not you. This is you, okay? You still have your, your whole full color, vibrant lifeline or else you wouldn't be here at a talk like this, okay? So I don't mean to be sort of Debbie Downer there, but you can see hopefully where resilience can land you. If, you, um, if you're only interested in survival, resilience is, is great for that. It'll keep you alive. If you're looking for anything beyond that, it's a, a pretty horrible strategy to employ as the only one, okay? So on the one hand, when career disruption strikes, it pulls the rug out from under your feet and it triggers your primitive brain into a threat response because you're facing all this unknown and uncertainty. And 
when your reptilian brain, when your limbic system is triggered into a threat response, that usually means that a poorly thought out reaction is going to follow. And unless you're actually facing a life or death event, those poorly thought out reactions don't do much for you. Okay. They're also you know, good at keeping you alive, but you end up regretting those, those rash uh, behaviors. Okay. On the other hand, why would these events promote growth? Well, for one thing, when you're shaken up, it allows all the, the parts that weren't really part of your core self in the first place to fall away. All the parts that were already loose, the parts that didn't really fit right, you know? The false beliefs about yourself that you've accumulated over the years. You know, from the expectations of others that you adopted as your own, okay, or the influences of your culture or your gender or whatever that have boxed you in to a path through life and through your working life uh, in a way that you never intended, okay? So it allows those pieces to fall away. And since it shakes up and changes the self that you know, the working self that you know, it sort of by definition demands that you reappraise your career on your terms, okay? This is how post-traumatic growth works. So it, it's a good thing to be shaken to your core because it sort of allows your core to be exposed to the fresh air so that you can remake your working self in the image of your most authentic self, okay? So wouldn't it be nice if you could have it both ways? So if you could sort of thread the needle and you know, avoid collapsing through fear and uncertainty and at the same time achieve post-traumatic growth. Well, that's what something I've come to call augmented resilience um, will do for you. So augmented resilience helps you cope with uncertainty without collapsing while still enjoying all the potential for growth, okay? So it sort of defies the odds. It defies that research I told you about, about from 2009 that says you most likely are only going to get one or the other. If you approach it uh, with, in, with the right intention and with the right techniques, you can actually manage both at the same time. And that's what the mid-career comeback is all about that we're talking about tonight. So I'm gonna give you three steps for achieving one. The first is establish safety find direction and create a future. Okay, so let's start with step one, establishing safety. So we just talked about the primitive responses that are triggered when you're facing a career disruption. So roughly, you know, these three here tie to the fight, flee, or freeze response that we have um, from our limbic system. So it might be you know, making a rash decision to change things up in your working life. It doesn't necessarily look like fighting though, like the flight, uh, like the fight response. Like it could be quitting your job in anger one day when you don't have any plan to back it up or moving across the country to, you know, as, as the solution to fixing your career when it's really maybe your own baggage that is the problem and that you're taking with you to the new location. Yeah. Or maybe uh, a reorganization occurs and someone lands in a different role than they're used to. And so they might instinctively feel like, well, okay, this is the end of the road. So I'm going to quit and now change employers without considering the opportunities that that change might open up for them or the things that maybe won't change that they like that they will lose if they make a change to a new employer, right? So essentially this one is leaping before you look, okay? So now that same person though might have more of a, uh, you know, a, a flight response where they're so freaked out by the idea of, you know, moving to a different company that they just resign themselves to these new responsibilities that they have that they don't like that, you know, may end up stifling them, but they don't want to risk the, the unknown, you know? 
or maybe they do change, but they jump to find a new job that's just like the old one without pausing to consider whether, you know, I have a, a sort of a natural break now. Let me consider if that's really what I want, right? And the third, this catastrophizing and tunnel vision, it's, it's like, uh, you know, I ride motorcycles and it's when you come around sort of a blind corner on a motorcycle and you find a rock in the middle of the road, the, the natural tendency of the rider is to sort of, you know, fixate on the rock as this threat. And what happens when you do that is you'll usually run smack into the rock. Uh, because it sort of closes off your vision of the, the escape routes on either side of it. The solution is to look at the path around the rock when, when it appears, right? So when threat emerges, it tends to take all of our attention, right? It's a, it's a survival response. It, and we end up getting tunnel vision. It closes off our ability to um, you know, see and consider other options that might be uh, better for a longer term well-being. And that's often what's happening when people are stagnating. So all of these are just recipes for ongoing problems. So one tool I'd like to offer you to help depower these primitive responses is mindfulness meditation. Many of you are probably familiar with it. If you aren't, then the sort of nutshell version is that Mindfulness is about cultivating a sense of awareness, curiosity, and acceptance of your unfolding moment-to-moment -moment experience of life. Right. And in doing this, we befriend change. That doesn't happen overnight, it takes practice, but we learn to coexist and ultimately befriend change. And when you do that, you, you know, friends aren't threats. So it doesn't mean that you necessarily like the outcome of the change, but it helps you be more comfortable in the experience of it and the process of it without needing to push it away or indulge in, uh, you know, a, a primitive rash response that'll end up uh, hurting you in the end. And it also, redirects your brain's activity from the limbic system, those primitive brain structures, to the prefrontal cortex. So the, they call it the CEO of the brain. It's you know, executive function. Uh, it allows us to plan, make wise decisions, and contemplate the future and what's in our long-term best interest. And importantly, just because I use the word acceptance doesn't mean that we need to like the way things are. And we don't need to accept that they'll be that way forever. We're just accepting them one moment at a time as the way things are. And in that acceptance, we find the freedom to change them uh, in a way that benefits us the most. So the idea is to explore the feelings that are coming up for you and allow whatever thoughts are coming up for you to emerge and then uh, and then disappear as they will, if you allow them to. So I wish we had time uh, to do a quick meditation. We don't, uh, especially with these tech glitches. But what I would encourage you to do is through the rest of the presentation, divide your attention in half, okay? And put half on the presentation so you can pay attention to what we're talking about. And then keep half of it for yourself. And see if you can, for instance, bring some awareness to what it feels like on the bottom of your legs where they're pressed against the chair or the sofa that you're sitting on. Or what can you feel where the soles of your feet meet the floor? You know, right at that, um, that place where the two touch, can you feel tingling or warmth or pulsating, any kind of sensation, right? Maintain some kind of contact with some kind of physical present moment experience while you're also paying attention to the presentation and see how you feel by the end. So I encourage you to develop a regular practice of mindfulness meditation. Uh, here's some resources. The Mindful Awareness Research Center right here at UCLA. This is uh, where I was certified as a teacher. Here's the website. Mindful Magazine has some good uh, mindfulness meditations as well. 
Insight Timer is my favorite meditation app. Um, they, they have a variety of different kinds of meditation. I would encourage you to stick to mindfulness um, for the purposes of what we're talking about here. Um, and finally, a little self-promotion, my own website. I've got some free guided meditations uh, there as well, ranging from 15 to 40 minutes. I'm trying to keep on track here time-wise. Let's see what we got. Okay. Uh, So as we become more mindful, we become better aware to catch the self-defeating thoughts that throw us off track. So these are the voices that, uh, you know, our, our inner critic, right? That um, say the kinds of things about ourselves that we would never say to another person, but they, we seem to allow them all the time when they're inside our own head. So what I recommend is to keep a daily list of the thoughts that arise that, uh, that you feel are getting in your way of either your performance or your sense of self, the way you feel about yourself. And when you have one on your list, then the next step is to put the thought on trial. So imagine that you're trying this, this thought and you're gonna mount a prosecution of it and a defense of it. And then once you do that, you're going to make a wise ruling that takes into account both sides, the prosecution and the defense. If you're familiar with cognitive behavioral therapy, this might ring a bell, uh, similar ideas, okay? I'm gonna give you a quick example. Here's an example of dust. I'm never going to find a job as good as this. Okay, so that's, that's kind of a Debbie Downer type of thought. You probably have a lot like these. You, you probably recognize the tone of that inner voice, right? Now, what's the evidence for that thought? Well, it might be, I have a lot of seniority at this place. I've carved out my own niche there. All of my coworkers are friends. Okay, sounds reasonable. I'm never gonna find another job like this. Okay, what's the evidence against? Oh, sorry, my industry is suffering. Evidence against. I've always landed on my feet. That's exactly the same thing I thought last time. I would never find a job as good as my last one, but then I found this one. I've hated the commute. I made the job good. It didn't start out good, okay, right? So you can see there's evidence for and evidence against. Now, what we're gonna do is make the wise ruling, okay, using both sides. Now, the next slide has the wise ruling. It's a, it's a fair amount of words. And so what, I, what I'd like you to do, rather than read it, is if you feel comfortable doing so, close your eyes and let me read it to you. I'd like you to listen and, and feel what it sound. Well, I'm, as you listen, feel what it feels like to hear yourself talking to yourself this way instead of that you know, sound bite that I'm never going to find a job as good as this, okay? Instead, what if you said this to yourself? I wasn't prepared for this layoff and I've had worries that I'll never find a job as good. It's especially hard because I'll miss the people and my role. But I need to remember that I wasn't thrilled with this job at first either. I made it great through my own skills, talents, and efforts. And I even developed a specialty that I can leverage now or I can go in a different direction. I have a choice. I'm going to see if I can target remote positions too, so I can cast a wider net in my search and hopefully telecommute more. Okay, how did that sound? You know, hopefully that sounded compassionate, but also realistic, okay? Importantly, realistic. We're not trying to BS ourselves here. We're, everything we said in this statement was true, right? That we found these things in our fact-finding mission, okay? We want to be upfront and honest with ourselves about the disadvantages and the advantage. The problem is that normally if we don't do this, we only see the downside, okay? Because that's what our limbic system wants us to see. It wants to see the threat, doesn't want to see the solution, doesn't want to see the positivity. So we have to make an effort to bring that up, okay? And balance out and give ourselves a fair and balanced uh, perspective. All right, step two. Find direction. So the disruption has occurred. You 
have experienced the, the threat response. Now you're feeling more calm, more cap you know, capable of being with that, that threat. You're already in a state of heightened clarity though. So like, why don't we take advantage of this, right? Because we remember we've got the threat, we have the tunnel vision that comes along with it. And when bleep gets real, right? You're closer than ever to what makes you tick. That's why it's gotten real, right? When the, right, when the sort of day-to-day, -day, um, um, you know, details that don't matter, right, fall by the wayside, and all of a sudden, you're faced with a problem that is pretty clear, then um, you're um, you're right there, like right? you're 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 closer than ever to to being able to touch your intrinsic motivators and identify what those are. So here's some questions for you to consider. Okay, with each blue question, I want you to arrive at the intrinsic motivator. Okay, so again, those are going to be things that are subjective, invisible, intangible, known only to you, and those are going to be your compass points to navigate by in this transitional period that you're in, okay? So what am I doing when time and space fall away? The blue question is, what capacities of mine are being exercised in those moments? Okay, what capacities or abilities are being exercised in those moments? What three career achievements am I most proud of? And the blue question is, what values of mine did I honor with them? By the way, I'm gonna have a link at the end uh, for the slides for people who are interested. Uh, and if, they, if you wanna sign up for my email list, I'll uh, send you the slides. Um, okay, so what values of mine did I honor them with, uh, with them? If I could feel twice as much of one feeling in my career by the end of the year, what would it be? What aspect of my career has run its course? And the blue question is why is it important to leave that behind? Okay, what's the intangible or invisible or subjective reason, right? That it's important to leave this aspect behind. Okay. So step three, now we've got our compass points and we're gonna go onward and upward with the new insight that you've gained from the last exercise, start exploring your path. Okay, so, so far we've talked about the intrinsic motivators and how those need to be intangible and subjective and invisible, right? Well, for the midterm and short-term parts of your goal, uh, goal strategy, we need those to be tangible and observable. These midterm ones though, I want you to keep them pretty general, like think of categories Okay, of responses. So for instance, what would need to happen for me to feel more gratified in these areas, okay, that I just identified in the last uh, step? How might other people be able to tell that I was making progress? Okay. I'm going to give you examples of these. So what would need to happen for me to feel more gratified in these areas? something that's observable and tangible, but general. How might other people be able to tell I was making progress? And then your short-term goal, this should be tangible and observable and specific. So if you're familiar with SMART goals, the acronym SMART, SMART goals, this is what a SMART goal should be, this short-term one. Uh, an, another uh, unintentionally bad myth is that we all of our goals should be SMART goals. And that's the exact opposite of what the research tells us about our long-term goals. They're great for short-term goals though, okay? So 
for the short term, what can I do this week that's in alignment with the compass points that I identified? What would feel a little bit difficult to do right now that's aligned in those same directions? Okay, so here's some examples for you. Actually, so I want to show you this. So we want our compass points to be on the horizon, okay? These are things that you're never going to arrive at, right? Because they're conceptual. They're not uh, actual places. They're just concepts that we're moving towards. So they're always sitting out there on the horizon. I would reassess those quarterly, okay? Your midterm ones that are more objective. Now you can see the path stretching out before you. It's objective, it's tangible, but general. Reassess those monthly. The specific short-term one, do those weekly and come up with you know 10, 10 of them a week so that you have a selection to choose from each day, okay? So these are your actual footsteps. Footsteps, path, horizon, okay? If you set up your goal-seeking strategy this way, then you are um, maximizing your chances of success and your feelings of well-being. It's if there's one thing we know from decades of motivation research, it's this. Okay. So if there's one thing you take away from this talk, it should be this. This is how to set up your goal seeking strategy. All right. So here's an example of uh, someone I worked with. Let's call him Derek. So he was a civil engineer and he actually liked being a civil engineer, but he found it mundane because he was working with people at a stage in developments where he didn't have any input really. So he was just sort of, um, you know, checking off boxes and he felt like a functionary. So we identified a previous uh, career achievement, right? In, in line with these questions that I just gave you that he had years ago when he was working at a contractor and he had come up with this new um, internal process for bidding on jobs that um, that helped them respond more quickly and you know, win more contracts. So uh, what he identified is that that experience had been honoring or reflecting his creativity. It was a way that even though he was you know, a civil engineer, he was being creative uh, in this way, in coming up with a new way of doing things. So creativity became a compass point for him. And he had a couple of ideas that he had been toying around with in his, in his mind that uh, that he found interesting. So he said, okay, for your midterm goal, why don't you make some time to brainstorm? Okay. See, so it's tangible. There's, you can see someone brainstorming, but it's very general, right? Well, the specific short-term goal then was to pick one of those ideas and play around with that for a week or two. Okay. So that's what he did. And it turns out, you know, he didn't have to keep trying to carve out more time for brainstorming because once he started doing it, it just took on a mind of its own. He was having, you know, so much fun. He was in a flow state, you know, thinking about this idea, working out the details of it, that he actually, you know, stopped watching TV and all the other stuff and just was working on this naturally because he was tapping into this intrinsic motivation and energy that he already had and that he had had the whole time, but he just hadn't tapped into it. So fast forward, you know, a month or two, he's getting excited about the prospects of this idea. And he's thinking that there really might be something to it. And he wanted to see whether it actually had any, any legs in, in the marketplace. But before he did that, he wanted to protect his intellectual property. Okay, so he wanted to explore the market potential. But first, he said, you know what, I need to get a patent on this, because I think it's good enough to protect Okay. So once he had the patent in place, he still, you know, okay, we still have these two uh, goals here. He's still focusing on uh, exercising his creative muscle. Now he's bringing this idea to market, exploring its potential. He's got the patent. So now what's left is to show it to builders. And so he went to a convention and showed them this, this idea. Basically, it was a way of laying out the, um, the, the floor plan of a building using technology instead of people and saving a lot of 
money doing that. And uh, so he was right. The builders did kind of go gaga over this idea. And like they started beating down his door um, to, to license this technology. So it was a success story. He still has though his civil engineering practice because he also gets some gratification from that work. But now he cherry picks only those jobs that are interesting, where he can be creative, where he's working with people he likes and you know, not just working with the, you know, he thinks you know, a lot of them are jerks, you know, he doesn't like working with them, it's no fun. Well, he just picks the ones that are fun and interesting for himself now, okay? Financially, he doesn't have to take any of them anymore, but he's doing it because exercising that muscle feels good for him in a deep way, okay? And so that's kind of the best part of this story and really kind of what I'm getting at here is it, it, it wasn't about the money, okay? It never was about the money. His original job or this new entrepreneurial uh, venture, none of it was about the money, okay? And he only focused, you know, initially on that, um, on the compass point, right? What's gonna internally, intrinsically gratify me? And then let the pieces fall into place as they will, okay? And now he's being rewarded for an expression of his own creativity. And it's more or less effortless, you know? Like for you or I, it would be a ton of work, but not for him because he's aligned with those things that are naturally motivating and gratifying for him. So it was about putting his inner expert or his core self first and then trusting this process to unfold. Okay. So guys, I have other examples and a few other slides, but I think we're out of time, uh, unfortunately, thanks to these tech glitches. So um, let's see, I'll, I guess I'll call Gloria back in to help us wrap up. In the meantime, I'm gonna advance to the um, slide here where you guys can stay in touch with me. Here, here's some takeaways, okay, real quick. You're a whole person, okay? You're not split. Work is not a different part of your life and you're not split down the middle as a worker and a liver. You're a whole person who has a choice of how to relate to the work that you do. You can choose to relate to it in a manner that suits you. It is possible to make friends with change, okay? One way to do that is with mindfulness meditation. If you use a complementary approach, approach of working with the difficult thoughts that undermine you, then you're going to develop a, a healthier um, uh, relationship with change and all the power that comes with that. You can't assume that your thoughts are trustworthy. Unfortunately, our minds tell us untruth all the time. Keep your long-term goals blurry and your short-term goals sharp. And if you ever feel lost, just check your compass, okay? Just check the things that intrinsically motivate and gratify you and make your next decision and take your next step in one of those directions and you can't go wrong, okay? So uh, Gloria, are we out of time here? Here's how to stay in touch with me um, let's see here. I don't know if I can put this in the chat. If you would like to download these slides, uh, I don't normally make them available, but for Bruins, I, I make an exception. I have this URL here. If you go to that page, you can, uh, if you're willing to join my email list, uh, I'll, I'll give you access to the slides to download or, or print. Um, you can always unsubscribe from my email list if you'd like, but even if you don't want the slides, if anything that I managed to cover in this presentation resonated with you, then I would encourage you to join my email list because uh, I, I'm covering these and related topics all the time with my uh, readers, okay? Uh, around career and other personal development topics that are related to it. So um, if you'd like, please head over uh, to that link and, um, and uh, check it out, okay? 
Great. Well, thank you so much, Jim. And thank you to everyone who was part of our session today. We really appreciate you all taking the time and energy to really learn more about this topic, which is so important. And you know, thank you again to Jim for leading us through these thoughtful questions and giving us a path forward. Um, we will send out the video once it's edited so that you have the full presentation. And we will send out his contact information and also his e that uh, website link that he had sent out to get the slides. Yeah, I just put it in the chat. It looks like it got buried already with everyone's thanks. And I, I want to thank everyone for uh, coming out. And I so apologize for all these technical uh, glitches. That it, I know how annoying that can be for everyone. I'm so sorry. Uh, but thank you for sticking with uh, the presentation and coming out. And um, yeah. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. And enjoy the rest of your night and go, go Bruins.